two hours and 27 minutes after he had started, a Brigham Young University steeplechaser, Demetrio Cabanillas, crossed the finish line to win his third straight Deseret News Marathon. Although he had hoped to set a new course record, Cabanillas' time was six minutes slower than the year before. The heat had taken its toll. At about the same time Cabanillas finished, I came out of Emigration Canyon and into the hot Salt Lake Valley. The temperature was already approaching 90 degrees. Hogel Zoo is at the 19 mile mark, and by now the pain in my left knee and thigh was excruciating. But the sight of so many spectators cheering on all of the runners temporarily took my mind off the pain. There were still seven miles to go, new territory for me, and from what I had read and been told, the most difficult part of the entire race. Ahead was the notorious wall, not a barrier of mortar and stone, rather something that occurs near the 20 mile mark. The body suddenly loses energy, and it's like running head on into a wall. My left leg felt like it had hit a wall miles before. Would I now run out of gas as well and suffer even more during the final miles? The answer came resoundingly as I rounded the turn from Sunnyside Avenue onto Foothill Boulevard. I'd read about it, talked about it, and dreaded the thought of it, and now I was experiencing it. Yes, there is a wall, and I crashed head-on into it. My injured knee stiffened even more, my pace slackened by about two minutes per mile, and I ached all over. Each step became an even bigger burden as I inched my way along the course. How could I ever run another five or six miles? It was little consolation, but others were hitting the wall too, some in worse shape than myself. Put on the wrong pair of shoes, I've turned my feet into a crossword puzzle. Is that right? You're pretty sore? Yeah, sort of a kaleidoscope of color down there, mostly blood. In spite of the pain and apparent loss of body fuel, I somehow kept going. The spray from a hose offered by firemen at the 13th East Station provided temporary relief from the scorching July sun, but I also discovered that the water added weight to my sagging frame and depleted even more energy. I would avoid additional showers. I had looked forward to running down South Temple. This is where I had been raised. The old family home was just up a side street, but now I cursed the sidewalk I had known as a youth. Each step along the uneven concrete jarred my aching body. A war was now raging within my mind. Every muscle and every fiber and all reason were screaming at me to surrender, but my goal, the finish line, was still several miles away. Momentary relief came at the 23-mile aid station when I slowed to a walk and inhaled a cup of water. But as I walked, my knee began tightening, and I knew that to continue walking would probably mean defeat. Somehow I mustered enough energy to pick up the pace and resume running. Ahead I could hear the music of bands and the blaring announcements from a loudspeaker. The parade route and final leg of the marathon was approaching. 200,000 people lined the two-mile corridor to the finish line and the end of my agony. I approached with some apprehension. If I'm going to die, let it happen now and not in front of 200,000 people. But the thought vanished as I turned onto Main Street and saw the throng. The sudden shot of adrenaline gave me new life as I heard people calling out my name and cheering me on. But the adrenaline wore off, and as it did, the horrible pain returned to my left leg. I felt totally drained and began wishing all of the people would simply disappear so I could endure my misery without the stares of a multitude. I wondered if every runner felt as miserable as I did. Was the heat bothering them as much? As I approached the finish line, each street became a goal. 
and to pass each street became a victory. Finally, the end was in sight. I noticed several runners ahead of me and dug desperately deep for some fuel reserve to energize a kick, but I was spent. There was no reserve, and suddenly all concern for time and place in the race became obscured by the screaming desire to stop running. How do you feel? I've got to have a drink. <laughs> Is that it? I just, I have never done anything, anything so difficult in all my life. Those last, last few miles were absolutely, the only thing I could describe is hell. <laughs> why anybody, <laughs> why anybody would do that. Of course, tomorrow I'll probably think back and look forward to the next one. Yeah, how do you feel about the Arizona Marathon now? I got it. The water bucket was empty, and another was off being filled, so I waited. My head was spinning, and my legs were wobbly. I found myself gasping for air, virtually unable to talk. My emotions were full. Tears welled up in my eyes as I found myself on the verge of crying, both from the pain and from the joy of what I had accomplished. I discovered I was not alone. Spread out before me on the grass were hundreds of other runners, each one deliriously savoring the achievement of having run a marathon. I had finished 330th in a field of 1100 so hundreds of others were behind me, and for the next several hours, they would continue their ordeal. But eventually, they too would win. Sure, a couple of dozen people received trophies as a tangible acknowledgement that they ran a bit faster and endured the pain for a shorter period than others in their respective categories. But to finish a marathon is to win a marathon. It's a victory that's sweeter than the Super Bowl and more satisfying than the World Series because it's a victory over self. So although my time was slower than I had wanted and I was back in the pack, I had reached my goal. I ran 26 miles, 385 yards, and I won the marathon.